vaccine rollout, but about the latest announcement when we look at essential tra uh, travel throughout the province, uh, visits to grocery stores and stuff, just consider what's essential and what you need to do. Back to you. And tonight, reporting live. Thank you, Christina. And many Toronto residents are questioning what will happen with outdoor skating rinks. The City of Toronto has 54 outdoor rinks and trails currently open to the public from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Shitty is not permitted, but Leisure Skate is with a 25-person limit. Exercise is important, getting out with your kids or, you know, yourself, um, especially because they're home all day, uh, you know, school, online. I feel like this is really important as well as parks, but, you know, it is confusing because they've said you can't gather with more than five people. This is obviously more than five people. So it's kind of like... Where, where's all the, uh, you know, where's the info coming from? What's the data that's driving all these decisions? And, and how are they making, opening some things and closing others? So. I don't think that as long as we're taking the precautions and, uh, you know, it, it as I say, exercise, I've been walking a lot and things like that. And it, it keeps you in a better spirit. It's better than sitting in a you know, condo all day or a, a small apartment. Now, what is confusing, and I agree, is the fact that there is a stay-at-home order, but um, other kinds of stores, other than pharmacies and grocery stores, have been allowed to remain open, which I, you know, frankly, don't think most of them should have been. Uh, I, you know, big box stores, I was clear in saying I think they should have just been closed except the grocery section um, and so on. But those are things that remain to be clarified. Another point that needs to be clarified is, you know, for example, uh, it says right here, that uh, no person is permitted to use an indoor or outdoor recreational amenity that is required to be closed. And then on the same list, it says skating rinks can be open. The city is expected to provide an update on skating rink regulations at today's 2 o'clock news conference. Okay, let's check in with George Lagadennis with a preview of what else is coming up in the show today. George. Courtney, thanks. Uh, Donald Trump's lame duck flame out continues. Uh, he's got a week left on the job. Uh, and he's about to become the first president in American history to be impeached twice. Uh, we'll be talking about Trump, past, present, and future with presidential historian uh, uh, Alan Lickman and also how this is all going to play out for President-elect Joe Biden and the security for the inauguration. That's in a week. Okay, George, we'll watch for that. Thank you. Sure. The province says it will conduct an enforcement blitz at large workplace facilities as calls continue to grow for the government to implement paid sick leave. For more on this, let's bring in CP24. Steve Ryan, who is standing by live and ranked in for us this afternoon. Steve. Courtney, because of the fact that we are in this state of emergency and we have this uh, stay-at-home uh, order coming into effect tomorrow, the uh, government yesterday, we heard, was quite clear in its remarks to big businesses, uh, big box stores, uh, regarding the fact that they must comply with all of the uh, orders that have been put into place. Otherwise, according to the Premier, uh, they are going to be fined. Uh, there's going to be a concentration, according to the province anyways, of uh, law enforcement officers who will do that enforcement. I'm not sure there's enough uh, law enforcement officers around to do all of that enforcement, but it is part of the solution. It's not the entire solution. Um, as you said, we are in Mississauga, just up front of the uh, Amazon Fulfillment Center here. They had an outbreak in December here in Peel Region, and uh, Patrick Brown, the mayor of Brampton, has been asking for paid sick leave for those who are off as a result of COVID. These guys did that. They gave sick, uh, two weeks sick time to their employees who are off, and uh, we spoke more with Patrick Brown about that, and here's what the mayor said. Take a listen. These essential workers are unsung pandemic heroes. You know, we're maintaining Canada's supply chain because of them. Medical supplies coming into the country from truckers, grocery stores that are full with food because of these unsung pandemic heroes. Um, and the very least we can do is to make sure we have their back. You know, they have Canada's back. We need to make sure we have their back. And one of the tools that we can make sure we provide is paid sick days, that if they do get sick, um, that uh, uh, we're not going to create an environment where it spreads faster because you have people with uh, limited symptoms going into work out of fear that they're not going to get a paycheck. Regarding enforcement, for law enforcement to go into a place like Amazon to do a spot check, that is doable because it's a controlled environment and everybody there is working for the most part. Having officers randomly stop cars to see if they're going to an essential place of service or to go to a grocery store or to a, 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 a drugstore can be problematic. So this is why the police are waiting for training with regards to this that 
part of the legislation because you are asking officers now to arbitrarily detain people because they are out and giving them the authority to ask where they're going and what they're going to get. Could be problematic unless it's in the legislation. Otherwise, it breaches the charter and that could be huge, huge problems. I'll send it back to you. Steve Ryan reporting live. Thank you, Steve. Now, when it comes to small businesses, advocates say the new restrictions are another step in the wrong direction. For more on this angle, let's bring in CP24's Kayla Williams. Kayla. Yeah, that's right, Courtney. And according to the CFIB, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses, they are calling the new Ford government restrictions that will be implemented as of tomorrow simply unfair for small businesses that are already struggling to stay afloat during this pandemic. Now, beginning tomorrow for the next 28 days, the Ontario non-essential retail stores can only be open open now beginning at 7 a.m. and must close by 8 p.m. However, grocery stores, pharmacies, convenience stores, and gas stations will be allowed to keep their regular hours. And the new rules come after the province's latest models suggested that without any new restrictions, COVID-19 deaths could double in Ontario between now and the end of February, warning that the healthcare system is on the brink of collapse. CFIB President Dan Kelly, who we had a chance to speak with earlier today, is worried about these new policies limiting opening hours and risks further crowding at essential retail stores such as big box stores and he's suggesting that by reopening small businesses and allowing say one to three people at a time it could actually alleviate some of the stress on big box here's more from dan kelly the premier seems intent on on killing small and medium-sized businesses wherever possible that seems to be right now, if I can understand this, the goal at this stage is to shut down permanently as many small businesses as we possibly can. Um, most of our members are not going to survive this in retail, hospitality, the service sector, even with all of the provincial and federal government support programs. It's just simply not going to be enough to keep these guys open. And Courtney, the Ford government did respond today with some frequently asked questions, giving some, um, a little more background as to some of the confusion from yesterday's announcements. And when people were asking why the province is issuing stay-at-home order while also permitting curbside pickup, part of their response said that the government of Ontario is determining what retailers may be considered essential risks, cutting off many Ontarians who don't necessarily live in large cities such as the GTA, uh, and that an urban center from access to necessary goods. So again, this is still something that is going to be a strain for many small businesses to stay afloat at least for the next 28 days beginning tomorrow. Back to you. Kayla Williams reporting live. Thank you, Kayla. Mm -hmm. Air Canada is suspending more routes in Atlantic Canada in a move that will impact nearly 2,000 employees. Starting on January the 23rd, there will be no service to Gander or Goose Bay in Newfoundland and Labrador and Fredericton in New Brunswick. Air Canada says this will mean the loss of about 12, about 1,700 jobs, that is, at the airline and affect more than 200 employees at its express carriers. Both Air Canada and WestJet have blamed a lack of federal support as the reason for their cuts to service in Atlantic Canada. Toronto's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Eileen DeVilla, will answer your questions live at 5.30 tonight. You can send a question or a short video clip to now at cp24.com or you can tweet us at cp24 and use the hashtag AskDrDevillaCP24. Well, sports news now. The puck drops on the NHL season tonight, and the Maple Leafs will be taking on one of their longest rivals. For more on this, let's bring in CP24's Jennifer Shun. Jennifer. Hi, Courtney. And those rivals, of course, are the Montreal Canadiens. It's going to be an NHL season unlike any other because of this pandemic. The Leafs will host the Montreal Canadiens at a fanless Scotiabank Arena. In a shortened season, only 56 games will be played this season as opposed to the usual 82 and lots of other changes that both players and the staff will need to adapt and adjust to. MLSC tells CP24 that the game tonight at the Scotiabank Arena will not be broadcast on the big monitor outside to prevent people from crowding there. Now, during the lease practice yesterday, the top line was once again 41-year-old newcomer Joe Thornton alongside Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. Leafs left winger uh, Morgan Riley says that, rather defenseman Morgan Riley says that the team is feeling uh, more complete this year. Take a listen. Playing um, the teams in Canada, you know, eight, nine, ten times. Uh, you know, having a cram, uh, you know, cram game schedule, not a whole lot of practice. Um, the protocols that are put in place, the whole thing is just a little interesting. And I think over time we're going to get more comfortable with it. But right now it's all a little bit foreign. Um, but I think we're happy to be back. I think that we're curious to see what you know road trips are going to look like and. Uh, uh, flights and stuff like that. So I think that 
as a team, we're, uh, we're trying to take it as it comes. So Toronto and these six other Canadian teams will only be playing each other in this uh, new season, which is part of the pandemic play. Now, in the 2019-2020 season, teams were essentially playing in sealed environments in Toronto and Edmonton. But now, of course, that bubble is broken. Teams are allowed to host home games and also travel for those road games. So that means uh, getting on planes and staying in hotels. Now, the NHL has already confirmed that 27 players have tested positive for COVID-19 during the uh, training camps, and 17 of those players players were from the Dallas Stars but once again it is exciting tonight for people watching at home which is what they can really only do at this time Toronto Maple Leafs will host the Montreal Canadiens Scotiabank Arena puck drop is at 7 p.m. back to you Courtney okay Jennifer thank you the Blue Jays have locked up their president and CEO. Mark Shapiro has signed a five-year contract extension with the club. The Jays posted a 32-28 record in last year's pandemic-shortened season and earned a wildcard spot. It was the first time the team made it to the postseason since 2016. Shapiro joined the Jays organization in 2015 when he replaced Paul Beeston. And coming up, a check on today's weather forecast. That will be right after this quick break. Stay with us. This morning. The fact is in the winter when you get the bright and sunny days, typically they are the cooler days. Here we are with a cloudy day and it certainly is uh, relatively warm considering the time of year we're in. We're at one degree right now, but let's get more weather details now. Mika Medola is outside getting a look at the forecast. So what are we in for, Mika? Yeah, we're in for warm conditions. I mean, the bill is right. Like the clouds act like a blanket. So it's keeping the warmth in. Highs of about three to four this afternoon. It's actually very comfortable here in the downtown core. I've got double sweaters on and my hat and I'm pretty dressed up pretty warmly. It's very comfortable if you need to go outdoors today. Three is our high. Southwesterly winds. Normal should be at about minus two. We should be feeling closer to minus double digits. So we've been very spoiled and we will be very spoiled for that be entire week. It feels like minus three outside and winds are southwesterly at about 20 to 25 kilometers an hour. We bumped up a degree, it's two degrees, but it still feels like minus three. And the warmest feel in the entire region is actually in Windsor right now. They feel like minus one. But we're down to zero for overnight low and we should be at about minus 10. Spoiled again for tomorrow, highs of four with cloudy conditions, showers or wet snow on Friday with temperatures at three. Two degrees for Saturday and then zero for Sunday. We cool down on Monday and Tuesday, but guess what, folks? We should be at about minus two to minus three. So that's what we're going to see on Monday and Tuesday. It's going to be cold, but it's going to be normal. Today's high above normal at three degrees. Let's go inside. Jen, next year on CP24 Live at noon, U.S. lawmakers expected to vote today on whether to impeach U.S. President Trump for an historic second time. We'll have some more analysis on that right after the break. Closed captioning of this program is brought to you in part by Bell. Keep an eye on your home from anywhere with Bell Smart Home. Home security just got better. Welcome back to Live at Noon. In the States, Congress is debating and about to vote at some point today on the second impeachment of President Donald Trump. Joining me now live with more is Alan Lichtman, author and distinguished professor and presidential historian at the American University in Washington. Thanks for being here, Professor. My pleasure. So the 25th Amendment to remove the president, kiboshed by Pence. Obviously, Trump will not resign. So here we are. The impeachment process is happening. You know, a handful of Republicans are going to cross the floor, but there's still well over 200 of them that will not. Now, is this less about, you know, Trump fever, uh, less about, you know, party over country or more about some of these representatives concerned about their safety if they vote against Trump? I think there's no question, you know, that we've really seen for the first time in recent history representatives really fearful of crossing Trump in terms of their own personal safety. And by the way, you know, Trump has incited these insurrectionists, these violent protesters, but he doesn't control them. He can't tell them what they do and don't do. And, you know, as reprehensible as Trump's incitement to insurrection, no less reprehensible is the fact that uh, he took no responsibility for what happened and has yet to tell these people, stay home, don't come out, let the transition proceed in an orderly and peaceful fashion. Instead, he 
said in a meaningless, passive voice way, I want no violence. That's not going to move to anyone. Okay, so that's uh, the House, but the buck stops in the Senate, uh, the Chamber of Sober Second Thought, as we call ours up here. What, what are the chances that, that uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who is rumored to be you know, supporting this impeachment, can, can sway that vote? And look, it, it is easy to vilify Donald Trump based on just what you hear and see. But you know, what about contempt prior to investigation? Um, shouldn't he be afforded a fulsome impeachment trial? Absolutely, he should be afforded a full impeachment trial, and that trial could certainly occur after he's left office. There's precedent for that. Ulysses S. Grant's Secretary of War, William Belknap, was tried after he was impeached, and he was tried after he resigned. Um, he was quitted, so the issue never came to the fore, but certainly Trump can... Uh, be tried after he's left office, and there were still some very relevant penalties. He could be deprived of his post-presidential perks, uh, office space, pension, travel allowance, although he still would get security. And, of course, he could be forbidden from ever holding federal office again, mixing a 2024 reprise of a run for the presidency. You know, from... Uh the escalator in Manhattan in 2015 to the, uh, to the Alamo yesterday in Texas. Trump seems to be bookending his presidency on the wall and that anti-immigration ethos. Is race really the only card he has left to play to try and hold on to the base? I, I think race and race-related grievances are his strongest card to hold on to the base. But it's a shrinking base. You know, his approval rating has plummeted in the last week or so, down to the low to mid 30%, and most of the losses have been among Republicans. While he still retains majority Republican support, it's dropped somewhere between 15 and 20%. And by the way, I give absolutely no credit whatsoever to those Republicans like Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham who in the 11th hour and 59th minute of this presidency seem to be jumping ship. They've spent four years enabling the worst impulses of this president, and they don't get a get-out-of-jail-free card. You know, Professor, there's all kinds of security concerns right now uh, at the Capitol and state capitals across the country. Uh, the GOP are calling out the Dems and the media you know, to turn the temperature down on Trump. Uh, that This impeachment's only going to incite more acrimony, maybe exacerbate more violence. It's time to unite. But my question is to unite with what and with who? I mean, what is the GOP brand post-Trump? It's a very diminished brand. You know, these folks have spent four years dividing us, uh, really playing footsie with these far out groups. And now when they're facing consequences, they suddenly are fulsomely saying, oh, it's time to unite. That makes no sense. The president needs to be held accountable. There needs to be a statement that such behavior is unacceptable. You know, what were we going to say after 9-11? Oh, we can't punish the perpetrators because that might spark them to do more terrorism. That's nonsense. That's not the way we approach things. And by the way, the Republican Party is in big trouble. Ironically, the Republican Party grew up in the 1850s when slavery blew apart the Whig Party. Now the Republican Party is facing a possibility of it being imploded from within it itself because of the huge divide between the Trump wing of the Republican Party and the more moderate wing, which really splits the Republicans right down the middle, and they've got to figure out what to do about it. And so far, they've shown no indication that they've solved that riddle of how to steer between the Scylla and the Charybdis of uh, the Republican uh, split. Alan Lickman, author, distinguished professor at American University in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Take care. Coming up next on CP24 Live at Unity, COVID-19 restrictions in Ontario kick in at midnight. And many people in the province still trying to figure out what the rules are, and the province trying to clarify them. We'll have more on that after the break.
departments to implement paid sick leave to help workers. A group milestone of COVID-19 deaths in long-term care homes has surpassed 3,000. And we continue to watch the events unfold in Washington as the House prepares to vote on whether to impeach Donald Trump a second time. Good afternoon and welcome to CP24 Live at Noon. I'm Nick Dix for The Province. He's reporting 2,961 new cases of COVID-19 today and 74 more deaths. 738 of the new infections are in Toronto, 536 are in Peel, 219 are in York Region, 171 new cases reported in Hamilton, and 119 in Durham. These numbers based on testing of almost 51,000 people. Now, the COVID-19 death toll in Ontario's long-term care homes has passed a bleak milestone. 36 more resident deaths recorded today, pushing the total since the start of the pandemic to more than 3,000. 10 long-term care workers in the province have also died from the virus. Well, it's now been a month since COVID-19 vaccines started being rolled out across the country, but only a small number of Canadians have been inoculated. Almost 400,000 people have received their shots so far. That is a little more than 1% of the total population. The Prime Minister announcing yesterday that Ottawa has secured a deal to buy 20 million more doses of the Pfizer vaccine as part of its effort to make vaccines available to all Canadians by September. In Ontario, another 11,231 doses were administered yesterday. That means nearly 145,000 shots have been given out across the province so far, and more than 8,700 people have received both of the required shots. In the meantime, a growing number of officials are advocating and calling on the Ford government to expand upon paid sick leave being offered by Ottawa. Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown today says it's necessary to help control COVID-19 cases. Well, these essential workers are unsung pandemic heroes. You know, we're maintaining Canada's supply chain because of them. Medical supplies coming into the country from truckers, grocery stores that are full of food because of these unsung pandemic heroes. Um, and the very least we can do is to make sure we have their back. You know, they have Canada's back. We need to make sure we have their back. And one of the tools that we can make sure we provide is paid sick days, that if they do get sick, um, that uh, uh, we're not going to create an environment where it spreads faster because you have people with uh, limited symptoms going into work out of fear that they're not going to get a paycheck. Now the province says it'll be conducting an enforcement blitz at large workplace facilities. So for more on that and how the new measures are going to be enforced, Let's go live right now to Steve Ryan. Good afternoon, Steve. Hi, Nick. Yeah, we're outside of the uh, Amazon Fulfillment Center here in Peel Region uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they have implemented a two-week uh, sick uh, grace period to those that uh, are, are diagnosed with COVID, as we just heard from Patrick Brown. But more importantly, with regards to enforcement, this is the type of place where uh, law enforcement officers, bylaw officers, can go into, as we heard from the Premier yesterday, because we are in a state of emergency and a stay-at-home order. If they can go in and inspect these sort of places to make sure that things are in order. There's nothing really wrong there with regards to safety of the officers or safety of those uh, that are inside. The problem with enforcing things is that you can't, you can't enforce it all. You need to rely on people themselves to take personal responsibility. There are not enough officers to go around, just like, let's say, uh, many fire stations are putting out fires everywhere they see. There are other calls to have to be answered. This is problematic when it comes to relying on, if that's the case, law enforcement to solve this problem. Law enforcement's a part of it, but more so it is us taking our own uh, responsibility. Um, we did hear from the uh, Ontario Chiefs of Police. They made remarks with regards to its upcoming new legislation and enforcement. And uh, here's what they said. Take a listen. I don't foresee um, uh, checkpoints and stop points and uh, right spot checks, if you will, being used to to enforce this, uh, but we will be, the officers will be responding obviously to calls from concerned citizens about any violations of large groups outside, outdoors and, and indoors. He's absolutely correct, and that's because the police cannot arbitrarily detain somebody. So it's easy to go by a Walmart and see if there's uh, uh, extra people in line or people in a park. You can do the counting, and there is a requirement to identify or you can be arrested but if you are talking about large-scale enforcement you can't just stop people in the middle of the night and ask them where they're going 
and proof as to where the that's arbitrary detention that's against the charter that could be problematic so there may be some teeth in this new provincial legislation and that's what we just heard in that clip the police will wait for that instruction before they start doing their enforcement let's set it back to you okay appreciate the analysis there steve thanks so much Time now to check in with George Boyer Dennis. He's got a preview of what's coming up in the back half of the show today. Hey, George. Nick, we'll begin with CTV's infectious disease specialist, Dr. Abdu Sharkawi. He'll be providing a very stark and dark dispatch from behind the front lines of the war on COVID and what it was like for him personally to lose three patients in just 36 hours from the COVID ward. And uh, it's NHL return to play RTP 2.0. Yeah, 309 days between home games for the Leafs. They will play on home ice tonight when they host the Montreal Canadiens. We'll uh, preview this original six matchup with TSN Radio's Matt Cause. And ahead of time, Nick, I will sort of give my regards to you for the thrashing <laughs> that your Habs will be taking at the hands of the Leafs tonight. You know, we got to say, fans. us Habs fans do have to admit the Leafs have a pretty good looking team. Actually. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> okay, I do that? I just jinxed it. Uh, got to add to the down south right now, actually, because U.S. lawmakers expected to vote on whether Donald Trump could be impeached. We'll take a pass on that, and we'll get back to that later on. In the meantime, some new COVID-19 restrictions from the province. Well, they kick in after midnight. The province is still trying to clarify the rules. So for more, let's go live to cb 21st Christina Tenalia. Christina, you're going to sort it all out for us, right? <laughs> well, here's the thing. The information from the province today, they put out a, a list of questions and answers for reporters because they've been getting a lot of questions as of we. But it doesn't offer much clarity. Essentially, what it says is use your best judgment. So, for example, one of the questions we've been getting a lot is what is an essential worker? Is there a list of essential workers? One of the things I've been telling people is if, if you've been an essential worker since the beginning of the pandemic, that continues. Uh, however, the government says they don't have a list of this because there's millions and millions of jobs in the province. And, of course, the goal is in terms of where you work and your employer, you need to work from home if you're able to do so. That's the message. What's an essential trip that people have asked? Well, things like picking up groceries, getting medications, going to a doctor's appointment, going to get a COVID-19 test. Use your best judgment there. Another question, what's, in terms of essential trips, how many trips can you take? Again, the idea here, everyone, is to stay at home. Don't leave your house if you don't have to, but there's no limit on trips. Here's some comment from the Medical Officer of Health for Peel Region. In the midst of the confusion, if you're not sure what the regulations are telling you, I think the message is clear that you need to stay home. We are seeing hospitals that are overwhelmed. We're seeing patients that are being transferred hours away uh, for care here in the region of Peel. Uh, we're seeing uh, surgeries uh, getting cancelled more and more. Uh, our hospital system is uh, is really on the brink of, uh, of a catastrophe. Um, and we're continuing to see cases rise, which is not what you want to see, because cases ultimately become hospitalizations um, and then become deaths, which have also been accelerating. There is some clear messaging, Nick, uh, on a few things. For example, gatherings are limited to a maximum of five people outdoors. In terms of indoors, you can only gather with those in your immediate household unless you live alone. You could hook up with one other household. And when we take a look at what's happening here in the province, you know, yesterday the modeling data suggested that in the next month or so, we could hit 100 deaths per day in the province. We got close last week with a record 89 deaths in one day. Uh, the message from provincial officials is if you care about your loved ones, stay at home as much as possible. The stay at home order takes effect at midnight until February the 11th. I know Steve Ryan chatted about enforcement. Uh, the idea is an officer's not going to pull you over and ask where you're going, but if you have concerns, you could call police about any kind of gatherings that you see. And we anticipate there will be enforcement for large gatherings out, let's say, even out here on the lawn of Queen's Park. Back to you. Okay, Christina, thanks for that. Meantime, many Toronto residents question what will happen with outdoor skating rinks. The City of Toronto has 54 outdoor rinks and trails currently open to the public from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Shinny is not permitted, but skating at your own leisure, well, that is, with a 25-person limit. Right now, we're happy that things like skating is open because then it, it kind of gives us something to do. Um, we need an outlet. Like, we need, we need something. So, um, this is great, but... I mean, if they close it, I won't be surprised if they close it. Because I get to skate, and you're skating outside. From a stress release standpoint, without a lot to do, it's it's really the, you know, for many people that I meet here, it's the number one 
if not, yeah, the number one way for them to have a day where they're actually out and getting fresh air and releasing that uh, claustrophobic issues uh, that everybody's starting to, uh, you know, suffer deeply from. So um, that's really my view, is that it's essential that they balance the mental health requirements with the restrictions. I agree that I'm sitting here with all the paperwork on my desk going through it this morning uh, so that I can try to figure this out and the city's going to have more to say and we've got the lawyers and the regulations have to come out. People should not be confused. What they have been told from the beginning by me and by the Premier and by others is to stay home. And, and by and large, we've said sort of stay home without exception. I mean, you should, if you can stay home all the time and never go out, that would be the best and not encounter other people other than those you live with. Now, there have been necessary exceptions that have been also clear from the beginning. Uh, if you have to go to work, and we have, thank goodness, people who are going to work in hospitals and running the transit system and all the rest, that's okay. If you have to go to the pharmacy, uh, going shopping once a week, grocery shopping. But I think it's been very clear. And the city is expected to provide an update on skating rink regulations coming up this afternoon at the 2 p.m. news conference, which, of course, we will carry live for you. Also, Toronto's Medical Office of Health, Dr. Riley Novello, should be at the news conference and should be here answering your questions this evening live at 5.30. Send a question or short video clip to now at cp24.com, or you can tweet us at cp24 and use the hashtag AskDrDevilla cp 24